way we try to do this. We try to cover, cover an aspect of what our trading community will be looking at next week. And then we'll just kind of open the floor to any other questions you have specifically around profiling or around trading in general. And uh, this time is yours. So however we can help you uh, benefit from that, we want to do that. Always been, begin with a risk disclosure. Hope this is self-evident. If you've been around markets at all for some time, you understand that there's risk just by looking at the fact that your P&L can change so quickly. So be, be aware of that and be mindful of that. We preach uh, consistently that risk is the only thing in markets that you have any control over. And so be mindful of that. Know what your risk is. Know what you're willing to risk. A little background on me. I'm Josh. I'm the founder of Trade with Profile. Uh, we've been in this game for about uh, well, a year and a half. Uh, so we're still new, but we're a, a trading skill development firm. And you know, I had a path like a lot of people you know, started away from markets. I, I found about markets through by a chance through a friend and, uh, and got hooked and absolutely love it. Uh, also on the call with me is JP, one of our trading coaches and uh, just an all around nice guy. Although he's a Kansas fan, which I'm not gonna hold him against him. Uh, hey, when he gets be nice. NCAA. Although I, you know, I got a full disclosure. So I'm an Indiana boy um, and my grad school is through IU. So uh, man, did you see that we had to apologize to Purdue because our fans were so nasty. Like um, that is hard um, since they are monster rivals. So yeah, yeah, just just terrible. That'd be like us apologizing for to Kansas State because it's Kansas State. You yeah, know? <laughs> yeah. It's in the middle of nowhere, Kansas. Oh, no um, every everything that we do and everything that we think about skill development as traders kind of focuses around these three objective areas. Um, I think that uh, success, consistent success in markets is at the nexus or the overlap of these three ideas. One is that, that there are four behaviors observable in every auction and that you know how to observe them, that there are four questions that you ask before, before you ask and answer these before you put a trade on so, and you know how to answer them. And then there are four stages of auction competency and you know which one you're in. Um, so all the work that we do is around building up these three focus areas. Uh, through specific principles and around specific trading challenges. So the challenge that we're going to talk about today is how can I come into the market each day, every day, and have a solid trading idea that I can express in any and every market? Is that, is that a challenge that resonates with anybody? Have you ever, have you ever thought that? Have you ever you know, come to the market every day and go, okay, what, what exactly am I going to try to do here? <laughs> why, why exactly am I interested in doing anything here? It used to be my daily routine, <laughs> right? Um, or how about this one? How about how about you just you like you come and sit at your desk and you're like, I have no idea. Like I'm I'm looking for something. I don't know what it is, but I'll know it when I see it. And like that that is a recipe for profit uh, loss, <laughs> no profit. And uh, we're gonna go after this challenge specifically and hopefully uh, change the game for a number of you today. And it's around this idea called the initial balance. So you, you may have heard this term, you may not have heard this term, um, but in, in the nomenclature that we use, so we are auction theorists. Um, there are a number of ways to approach markets. There, there's a fundamental approach. So like if you watch you know, CNBC and Bloomberg and you hear people talk about you know, valuations of companies, they feel countries, companies undervalued, overvalued, they're, they're, they're bake, basing that on some fundamental principle of the financial uh, opportunity in the company and also what they see for future growth. If you're trading commodities, it's often based around some economic report, i.e. we have a crude inventory report, crude inventory goes up. So that means there's more supply available that should do what to prices, prices should go down. That's a fundamental idea. Um, there, that's, that's one way to look at markets. The second way is technical. And so this is where you see people who spend all these times throwing all kinds of lines on their charts and they've got oscillators and indicators and you know all manner of different thing. Uh, and that's an approach to markets. And the third way, uh, which I would argue is actually the really only consistently effective way, is behavioral. And, and what I mean by that is that we look at auctions as the, the sum of human activity. There's humans that express opportunity in the markets, and they do so um, based on all kinds of things that drive people, right? Fear, greed, opportunity, concern. Um, like anxiety, these are all things that are present in the market all the time. And uh, even, even though we have 
computers and algorithms running. What we find though is all of those computers and algorithms are built around the perspectives of humans. So it's just programmed human behavior, which is predictably irrational. <laughs> and the other thing that's, that informs this, this behavioral aspect of, is if you, when you, if you spend time, um, as both JP and I have, around people who have been, you know, when there were trading floors, when there were trading pits, if you talk about those people, there, there's an assumption that those people did all kinds of uh, robust research every night. You know, they were pouring over reports. They were doing all kinds of analysis before they got to the market every day. And what you find is instead that they were out partying, partying and they had, you know, really no discipline, except when they got to the auction in the morning, they could read behavior really well. Think of it like playground politics. Like who's the bully on the floor? You know, who's the nerd in the corner trying not to get called out? Like they could read that, which is all behavioral. And that, that has not gone away. Um, a lot of the, the things- The key to that though, Josh, is that they could see the whites of their eyes where we can't. That, that is exactly, oh, that's a, such a sentient point. So they could see it, right? They could see the behavior on the floor. Uh, now that there are not pits, we go, well, how do we see that behavior? How, how can we graphically see that? So what we, when we talk about initial balance, what we're looking at is the first hour's range of trade, the price range of the first hour, which you know, still represents 80% of all trade volume. And we use this as kind of a, a benchmark to help us figure out you know, who is the bully in the room, who's gonna make a move, who's not. Um, so even if we're trading in some remote place or by ourselves, we can still see that. Uh, and here's the principle behind that, is that uh, based on continued initial balance behavior, we find that uh, extending the initial balance range provides insight into the player in control and how strong he or she is confirming or negating a bias in the session. And in the sen in, essentially, he who fights the player in control often loses. So, you know, knowing who that player is, and you know, either aligning ourselves with them or going against them in a subversive way <laughs> as to not get caught becomes uh, important. And if you don't figure this out, then what, here's what's gonna happen. And here's how you know that you're going against the trader in control. Is you're gonna put on a trade against a controlling trader and you're gonna feel maximum pain fighting that counter trade. Because there's, there's nothing that's changed that control. And so you're gonna be like, man, why is this thing not working? Why, why am I not? find success around it, it's because there's a player, a trader in control of that auction that you're trying to fight and you're not big enough to fight them. So you're gonna lose. But if you plan for your trades with respect to what we call other time frame behavior or the, the player in control, as defined and displayed in the opening initial balance range and its extension, it sets reasonable expectations for potential activity for the remainder of the session. and you know, two, two things, you know, we talked about one thing we have absolute control over is risk, right? Like that's the one thing we have absolute control over. The second thing that we have some control over is expectations. And the, you know, while there are what we would call black swan events or outlying statistical events that we need to account for and have contingencies built for, there, there are consistent behaviors that the auction shows. And we can lean on that to help us uh, build an expectation and build trades. So uh, with that, I wanted to show you this. Uh, so what this is, is three products. We've got uh, treasury bond futures on the left, we've got crude oil futures in the middle, and we got the S&P 500 in the right. And this is going back, you can see bars evaluated at the bottom. This is the number of, of sessions that is uh, in play. And you'll notice that there's a thousand trading sessions, uh, roughly, you know, illustrated in all of these, right? There's 1,997. And why a thousand? So a thousand, there's about 252 trading sessions every year. So if you get a thousand sessions, you're looking at about five years of data. And um, when we look at this, we find some interesting things around that first hour's range of trade. Okay, so if we look at, let's say for example, if we look at the S&P 500. So we say, okay, we're those thousand sessions, the last thousand sessions, 383 of them only extended the initial balance high. So that means if, if I have a, you know, the opening range, or I have a high and low of this first hour's trade, 38% of the time, you know, I only extend to the upside. 
I extended to the downside 314. So if I combine those numbers, right? Somebody want to run the math? If I, if I take 383 plus 314, I get 6,697, which is out of a thousand sessions. So that's what percentage? That it extends only one side of that initial balance range. Anybody good with the maths? 70%, exactly. We're going to round up, right? Um, so a 70% chance that on the ES over a thousand trading sessions, we're only going to extend that opening range in one direction. Is that is that edge or what? Like like as soon as and and look look at the look at this. I've got three products here, right? Because they the behavior is the same. This is bonds. These are these are financial markets. This is an energy market. This is an index market, and they behave the same. Isn't this remarkable? There's there's only a two and a half percent chance that that we won't extend that range. There's only a two and a, a, you know two point four percent, three point two percent that we won't. You know around a thirty percent chance that we'll see both sides of that range in a given day. This, you know, like when I ran across these stats, this was like a game changer for me because now all of a sudden I think, okay, well, let, let's let's talk about uh, live markets, right? So let's let's jump over here um, to a live market. All right, so we're looking at the the Nasdaq futures here, over here on the right, and I've got this is the this is that opening range, okay? And so you can kind of see what I mean by this opening range. Um, Expand the profile here. All right, so I'm looking at the first each each of these. These are called TPOs. So this is time, price, opportunities. This is the, this is the range of price for the first half hour, or what we call A period, and this is the range of price for the second half hour, which we call B period. Okay, so we combine those together to get the initial balance opening range, and today that has been 113 ticks in this product. Uh, the average actually is 182 ticks. So we actually had a tighter initial balance than average. Um, but the fact that we've extended it, now which way did we extend this range? Somebody tell me which way we extended the range. Did we extend it higher or lower? Range extension higher, exactly. So range extension means that we, we've exceeded that range to the upside, right? So if we went to the downside, that would be range extension lower. So based on these statistics, what we can now say is, all right, I can see this, this price down here at 70, 90, or 70, 54. What's the probability today that I will exceed 70, 54, 50? Nobody thought there'd be a test. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. 30%. That's right. 70 minus 30, because 100% probability means it's a guarantee, right? 30% probability that we'll see 70-54 today. Okay, so that now that means that I can lean, I that that I can lean against that uh, metric. Um and, and do something with it. Now, in our community, we, we build, you know, when, when traders start working on this, we, we build around an anchor trade. And we, we, there's two ways that we look at this opening range and how we play it. So one of them is that we look to go with that extension. So, you know, when we see extension, what that's telling us, whichever direction that you're extending, that's telling you who's in control. And so today, actually buyers are in control of this market. Um, So if I want to be short this market, I want to be smart about where I want, or I want to find places to be long that give me an opportunity to extend. Now, the, the question is, if I want to be long, where do I look to be long? So here's where we bring some other statistics in to play. 
Okay, up here I've got another mark that is, and I, I, full disclosure, I'm actually short this market right now. And I'm gonna walk you through why I'm short and what I'm looking for. And there's another line up here that's at- uh, It's working good. Yeah, it is. And I wanna make sure I got my stop in as I'm trailing this here. Hang on one second, guys. Yeah, nice. Um, excellent. So the, this line that I have up higher is, oh yeah, get it. Come on, just a little, few more. I'm just gonna make sure that I have as many as I think I have. Okay, good. Um, think about that. Thank you for your patience. So this line up here is at 50% extension. So we said it was 113 ticks on the IB. So this is, you know, about 60 ticks higher is 1.5 the initial balance. Now, here's an interesting thing. When, when I go back a thousand sessions and I look at the extension of the initial balance range, I find that there's only a 25%, man, I'm not real good at, there's a 25% probability that I will exceed this level, which I did today, okay? Now, this is 1.5. If I go out to two times, basically I double this width, which gets me up to um, around 71.15. There's only a 17% chance that I'll get up there. So now that I've seen that we've gotten up here, what I'm looking for is I'm expecting, okay, there's, you know, we're, we're kind of exceeding expectations statistically on this product. So I'm looking for opportunities to rotate back in because I'm basically saying while there are buyers in control, there's not been people who have like jumped on behind them to really ex extend this thing further into a trend. And so now we're more likely to rotate back lower, which is what we've, we've just done. And, and we, could, we could rotate as low as 70-70, but I don't really have high expectations that we'll see 70-54. So in my short, I'm looking for reasonable targets inside of the range representing the statistics. And, and kind of as a general rule, how it works is if I see IB high extension, I'm kind of targeting at least you know, this 1.5 or if there's a key decision level that I'm looking for above. And if I get a pullback, after I've had the extension, you know, that's, that's kind of where the value is, then that's an area that I can go long. If we go to 1.5 first and then get a trigger, then I'm looking for the short to go that way. And that's the anchor trade. And it works in every product every day. Now you don't, you don't know which one you're gonna get. You don't. So that's the part you don't know, it's, it's unknown. But you can set the criteria, you can set the targets, and, and have reasonable trade. And in this trade, you know, now conditions have changed slightly because we've migrated the point of control higher. But you know, there was a high volume node down here at 7072 that looked um, interesting. So there was a price to value divergence that further increases the opportunity. Whenever you see price and value diverging, that's opportunity in markets. Now in this case, that opportunity is going away because value is coming up to where price is. Although it has migrated lower from where it was early on. Like, you know, the, the point of control was here in F period and now it's moved back lower. Um, basically, I think what's happening, we've got uh, a trade meeting taking place here and what, when's that meeting? Is it 2.30 Eastern? I think that's right. I believe it is, yeah. Yeah, so nobody wants to make big bets before Trump opens his mouth. So that, that, my friends is the initial balance. And what I, what I find, you know, when, we, when traders come to us and, and they are struggling, I often find that they're trying to be active really early and in the first hour, because here's the other thing, okay? There's a 97% chance, because we looked at those stats, there's a 97% chance that I'm gonna extend this range in one direction or the other. Well, what happens if I'm inside this range? What happens if I was short, okay? Well, with IB high extension, I would have faced max pain, wouldn't I? So if you're gonna be active, if you're gonna be active in the first hour's trade, 
you had better have a really good idea and a rational expectation for that for to be active in that because you know there's a 97 percent chance which i think that's a pretty high probability i will i will go i will bet on that one i like that one myself i like that one a lot that that i will i will i will leverage that and think about that all the time and you know any trader that, that we work with that's struggling like we if we just tell them wait for that first hour performance increases now here's a here's a question that we get asked although nobody's asked it i'm going to answer it because it is asked is why the first hour why not the first five minutes why not the first 10 minutes why not the first 30 minutes why not the first 45 minutes okay you and i welcome you to challenge this but i i keep running the numbers and i thought because i wanted to be active you know, there, there's it seems like there's lots of opportunity in the first hour's trade right everybody's like oh i'm so excited for the open but what you find is that if you try to find similar statistics on the first five minutes, it's 50-50, no edge. First 10 minutes, 50-50, no edge. First 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes. It's not like until you get to an hour, it's never better, better than 50-50 odds. So there's no edge. Edge says I got a better than 50-50 chance. When I get to an hour, if I just wait for that first hour, all of a sudden, Boom, there's edge. That's why we that's why we still preach that hour. And, and let's also be mindful that times have changed in the markets. But um, in the old days in the pits, they used to use what's called the opening range, which depending on what product you were using, could have been anywhere from five minutes to twenty minutes. And um, and remember everybody in the in the pits were typically super scalpers for ticks. And we didn't have quite the volatility that we have today, nor the range. And the 60-minute uh, statistically is is um, superior to anything else. Yep. Yeah, I mean, if I if I found one that was better than I mean, if JP and I, you know, could because we keep going back just to check, right? It's, it's always kind of a rolling five-year bit of data. If if we found that it was, you know, better earlier, hey, I'd love to be active earlier. Um, and they're, you know, not to say that we aren't active sometimes in that first hour. Um, there, it's what we call an IB trade pre-confirmation. You know, so sometimes you take the trade because you believe that the auction is going to extend in one direction because you're, you know, that it's going to most likely, and so you're, you're active on that. You still have to define risk against that, and and you know, use one of the rangers around that. But that's and let's um, just take this. Can we take this trade just for a quick mm -hmm. example? Mm -hmm. Where did buyer step in now on this last move lower? right at the IB high. Mm -hmm. So that's where it got cut off. And now yep. we're back above that IB high right there. So the, the 60 minute, a lot of people look at the 60 minute and they use yep. it. Yep. Yep. So I hope, I hope that's enough to wet your whistle. If you want, if you want to dive into that uh, more with us, um, that's what we're going to be focusing on this week is IB extension and how we use it as part of our anchor trade. And, um, with that, we're going to go to other questions. And I actually have, this week, we actually have a question um, from one in our community who couldn't join us for the call. But uh, she's asking, I look at order flow. Uh, once price gets to a pre-identified level, once the challenge I have is once order flow confirms my setup idea, I often find myself with a structural stop too far away from the ideal entry. Are there any other tricks or techniques to using order flow that would help reduce price risk and still give decent confirmation of the trade idea? Also, what would be best practice idea to assist with identifying two to one reward to risk opportunities intraday? Okay, great, great question. Um, so, so first thing, you know, in any trade idea, we always start with opportunity first. So, you know, so what I, I find traders who can find triggers to get into a trade a lot, um, and especially when they're looking at order flow data. And, and if, if order flow data is a new thing, let me let me blow this up to you just so you can kind of see what I mean by order flow data. And um, and what exactly I'm uh, let me let me grab a let me get a price ladder here so you can see this too. Okay, so here here's a ladder that's showing us. Um, you know, or open orders that are on the ask versus the bid, right? And you can see they're, they're always offset each other a little bit, but you know, the ask is the highest price or the lowest price that I can immediately buy. So if I want to be long 
NASDAQ, I can just click and there we go. Uh, 86.70.50 is the, you know, the highest price I could sell. And there are trades going off at these prices. Now, who, you know, what kind of trades? Were they sell or, sells or buys? Um, that's a way that we're measuring the order flow. And on this platform over here, on the left, you've got contract volume. So this is how many contracts were traded at every price in a five minute period. And then it's got a total showing me how many are there. In this one, it's showing me um, the delta, the difference between, the, you know, of these, of these prices traded, it's telling me, okay, were they more buy side or sell side? And then what, what was the total? And I actually have this filtered to 10 contracts or more. So that's why there's lots of zeros because I wanted to see more strong behavior um, than others. So like if I look back at um, this place where they came into the, the point of control, which you can actually see there's quite a bit of volume there. Or I'm not the point of control, back into the, uh, the initial balance range and the, and the volume weighted average price, that's the VWAP. Um, is that from a size perspective, it was ultimately the buyers that won because a negative number in this means that, you know, as they were coming down, they were just finding buyers. So buyers were absorbing this push lower, you know, to kick them back out. Um, so you can, you can get uh, over analyzing on the order flow. Uh, you, you really can. Um, and we find traders, that especially with some of the products that are out there that, that's, you know, like footprint charts or, uh, book map and other things which are effective products but if you start with the trigger into the trade and if you're using order flow into a trade what's going to happen is you're going to get into more trades than you need to be in and and you're not thinking like well, what's the opportunity of the trade that i'm looking for and you know why would i want to be in that trade and um so here's here's one way that um that i think about that i'm going to actually turn on a different view because this, i think this one's a little bit easier for people to understand and discern so um, let's say that I was, you know, and early, earlier in the day, there was a point of control down here at 7070. Okay. And that's the opportunity. And if I believe that the, you know, we've, we've exceeded this 1.5, the IB, and, you know, I think we're a little statistically stretched. So I want to find an opportunity to go towards this 60, you know, 70, 70, area. And, and I'm actually, um, you know, so that if I'm trading around 97, okay, that is almost 30 points of, of opportunity. So from a risk to reward, I like to, I like to set up trades. If I can, my target is three to one. So that means if I'm looking for a 30, 30 point opportunity, I'm willing to risk 10 points. Okay. Um, does a couple things. One, it means if I'm wrong, I can be wrong a couple times and then be right and be back to break even. So th this why identifying this is hard. What I find a lot of people who say a risk reward on their trades, um, they're just picking a number arbitrarily. They're, they're not actually, they're, they're like, well, I get in this trade because of trigger and I'm going to try to hold it for X number of, of reward. Um, but there's, there's really no reason or rationale why the price has to go to that. In this case, if price can't migrate value higher, then it's likely to return to value. That creates the opportunity from an auction standpoint. And then notice this five minute period right here. Okay, so a couple things. This little histogram that's in, so this is a 30 minute histogram. This is showing me volume traded. So this is the contract volume for 30 minutes and it overlaid on top of it is that same order flow data. And this is actually graphically showing me the difference between the, the intensity of the buyers versus the sellers. So if it's on the right side, that's impulsive sellers. If it's on the left side, it's impulsive buyers. And this is actually filtered to show me the top 10% of order flow in that period. So if, it, if it's a magenta or a red, that's the top 30% of trade volume in the order flow. Meaning that if I see price, like, like see these two histograms where it's not showing me any uh, impulsiveness at all, it means like there's no strong behavior there. There's nothing to lean against. But um, strong behavior should follow through past that. This is kind of the first kicker that, so we had impulsive buying behavior before, had a, in another area of buyers moving higher and, they could, and then they were met with sellers that engulfed them with selling order flow. Okay, see that? Then here's, here's another opportunity where the sellers are stepping in. So when they, when they drop right here and break here, now mindful, I'm looking for a target here, okay? Um, 
I can I could be short the NASDAQ and I can defend this initial opportunity up here. That gives me 10 points of risk for my reward. So I'm basically, I'm gonna lean on these other sellers where that initial base was as a place. And notice that we have not traded past through that yet today. And we get, and so far the, the maximum favorable, favorable excursion has been 77, which is you know getting close to the target. So that's that's how you can now you can you could further tighten it up and you could say all right well you know here's the first move and then here's the next push lower and then you could defend you know the top here and you know that was taken out um, I I find you know like where that first move is the one that that really is the one to lean against and then after I see them kind of push like like once they start rolling over again then you could move it down um, and defend it. But, but that's, that's kind of the way that I use that. I use order flow to help me trigger and define a tighter risk on the trade. I don't just look, you know, I don't just look at every little tick of movement and go, oh, there's an entry. Oh, there's an entry. Like you start with the opportunity first and, um, and have some expectation around that. And that's where that IB trade can help us. You know, it can help us identify the opportunity of where we're looking for a rotation lower. At the time, that was the trade. Now, you know, what's changed is that the point of control that was down here has migrated higher. And so there's not this price value divergence that originally set up the opportunity. And actually, you know, we talked about those four questions that you answer before you find a trade. Um, you know, one of them is what, what needs to happen behaviorally for the trade to still be valid? And I need that price and value divergence to exist because that's gonna create acceleration in the trade in the direction I wanna go. If, if value migrates to me, then that's telling me that the auction is not is accepting where I'm at and I'm likely going to you know potentially trade higher and I need to defend the trade. So you'd still be in the trade but behaviorally it's not going the way you want it to go. So I hope hope can really that helps. Um, any other questions or and JP I mean anything you want to add on the order flow side? No, it's perfect. I think the most important thing to remember is it's not um, an actual trade setup. Um, it's just a tool that we use to help us define and like Josh said, to um, tighten up our risk on this where we know where um, maybe buyers or sellers will step in and defend that level and we can lean against that. That's an edge, we call that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there are individuals out there and there are organizations that teach scalping and stuff like that um, off of order flow. Um, that, that's really tough. Okay, with algorithms today in the world, they can move that market in a second and wipe you out. Um, so again, not, not, I mean, that's not my style. I know it's not Josh's style, so mm -hmm. I don't recommend that. But yeah, it's one of the biggest, uh, in my my personal opinion, game changers out there in the marketplace. Um, before, you know, we had to lean against highs and lows of candles and stuff like that and defend the high, defend the low. Um, maybe, you know, some people use different types of trigger methods. There's, there's loads of them. I, I highly recommend a trigger in your trade, no matter if you use order flow or not order flow, I just highly recommend it. It's just a way of disciplining yourself um, and controlling what you can control, which is what? Risk. Risk. So um, looks like somebody wants to look at crude oil here. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry. Um, Joel. Yep. Joel. We know Joel. Um, yeah, really, really. Uh, f did, did we ever find out what the news was? Was there a news? I think, oh, you mean this morning on the six yeah. o'clock? Yeah, I think what they did is they, they've been talking about how China, um, you know, this deal with China that's coming up, um, that would that could have an effect on crude oil. And I think they popped it off that news, but obviously that didn't stay long. So mm, gotcha. Buy the news or buy the rumor, sell the news, whatever. Buy the rumor, sell the news. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, yeah, so so a couple things on on crude today that uh, are interesting so we opened with it with a gap and uh, we measure gaps from the you know the the rth range so this is the the overnight overnight session okay so this is the rth range from there to where we opened um, we're looking at about a 65 cent gap 
And we measure range based on a percentage or gaps for our gap rules on a percentage of the expected range of the product. Okay. So you, know, you may have heard of like an average trading range as a, as a vehicle to set expectation. I think average trading ranges can be pretty good because it can help you get accustomed to the typical behavior of each product and, and different trading products have different um, daily uh, notional risk to them. And, um, you know, some are really small. I think that's why, you know, we, a lot of guys, especially in the ag side, they start trading corn because it just doesn't move much, <laughs> you know, or, uh, but, you know, crude, crude can move a pretty decent amount. And right now, uh, the average trading range in crude um, is about $1.63 in range. But the expected range, so the expected range is the, it's a calculation based on what the implied volatility level. So any product that has options that can be sold against it as a, as a risk measure uh, can be put into something called the Black-Scholes formula, which actually helps us create a probability of range. Um, because options are a two-sided market, so you have both buyers and sellers of the market and people who are trying to you know, judge risk, they can express uh, risk premium around that based on you know, the anticipation of how much that market's going to move, which is kind of cool because it, it's a, it's a forward looking metric, which where an average trading range is just a lagging metric, right? So an expected range. So I can come in each day and like today, the, the average trading range again is a dollar 60 something in, in crude, but from a uh, expected range, we were only, we're only expecting there. We're only expecting a dollar four. So about 50 cents less than, the average trading range. And again, that's looking at yesterday's price uh, times the implied volatility level times the square root of one divided by 252 is the math on that. And there will be a test on there that. There will be a test later. <laughs> and, and what that will tell you, uh, what, what the math tells you is there's a 70% chance that we'll stay inside of that dollar, um, what I say, dollar four. Okay. So if you, if you took if you took the overnight low and you add it to the overnight high, okay, we're looking at about $1.20. So we've exceeded the expected range. Okay, so here's, here's overnight. So those expected ranges are based on the whole globe accession, which, which is basically all of this, all right? So that's so, a great question. Joe says, where does the expected range start? It starts at the globe X open. Yeah. Um, so, so whatever and, particular product you're, sorry, Josh, right. whatever particular product you are trading, just need to know when the Globex session opens. Yeah, yeah. So it's from yesterday's close, you know, that's the expected range. And then measuring the range is from Globex low to, you know, whatever the total range has been. And so far, we're actually trading inside Globex the whole session. We've not exceeded that range, which, by the way, that's a statistic anomaly. Um, there's only a 3% chance that we don't take out either the overnight high or overnight low in any period. And, and what you typically find is when that happens, it's because there was like, like today, there's some kind of odd news event. Um, but we open with a gap. So gap is here to here. And, you know, we look at gaps. So not all gaps are the same. You know, have you ever noticed like some gaps close like really quickly and some gaps hold and some gaps like they, they gap and go, and then it just seems like they're never going to stop going in the direction of the gap. So how can you have an expectation around the gap? And um, what we find is that if we take a percentage of the expected range, so if I take, you know, a dollar uh, expected range, if I take 25% of that, which is about 25 cents. So, so if, if crude had gapped from, you know, 57.15 to 57, uh, what is that 40 would be 25 cents? Is that right? 15 plus, or is it 30? 30 would be 25 cents. 30, no, 40, that's 40. Um, if we're, that's what we call a tier one gap. So on a tier one gap, there is about a 65% chance that the gap will close. Okay. Now, if we go to 50% that range, so if we go 50 cents, so if we go to 65, okay, at 65, so 65, you know, 50% of the expected range, there's a 50-50 chance that will close the gap. So what you're seeing right now, and we basically had, you know, a little bit more than a tier two gap. 
uh, if you get more than 75 cents away, which is closer to 80, right, which is we had hit, um, that's what we call a tier three gap. So if you're at 75% or, or more of that expected range is tier three gap, there's only a 3% chance that gap will close. And again, all these stats go back a thousand trading sessions. So, you know, then how do I trade that and what my expectation for it is, then I go back to the initial balance and see what the initial balance does. And today, that initial balance um, was wider than average. You know, we average, uh, I'm sorry, was not wider than average. We averaged in 60 cents. We did 46 cents today. Um, but look, look, how, look how much of that overnight range it, it carved back in. So then if I add, and this this will, man, we, I didn't expect to do this much math today, JP. Um, then if I add the stats about the uh, 1.5, the IB extension. All right, so here's IB low. Here's 1.5 gets us back inside of yesterday's range. Now we've actually got, and we were talking about this inside our community, there's a, there's a target down here, this 56.92. I don't know that we're going to get there. I don't think we have enough time yet. Um, but we almost closed this gap. You can see we almost, almost closed that gap. But there was an opportunity, you know, to look short back toward this target here. So we were actually looking for, you know, once, once we saw IB low, we were looking for rotations higher to be short back toward this area. Um, overall, I mean, other, other things that I would say editorial about crude, um, just from my perspective is, um, you know, one of the reasons that we kind of paused where we did at this 5730 was that was a, an untested prior point of control. So these things do work. They do hold the auction. And if we didn't hold this one, then the next, you know, likely place is down here, 5692. Um, so then Monday, um, we'll be watching 5740 area and, you know, see, are we, are we above it or below it? And if, you know, if we're below it after the first hour, we'd look for a move back to 5692. And if we're above it, then any price higher is possible. And I think, I don't think I have another level higher for a while. Um, let's see. Yeah. 5861. That's a ways away, but that's uh, that's within the expected range, right? So if you know if we close at fifty seven thirty nine, um, it's just a little bit better than a dollar away, which is what the expected range. Good question. What else? What else can we look at? Questions we can answer. Ask JP a question. I've been talking too much. No math, please. I've had my share of math in life. <laughs> Any questions, guys, on anything? Uh, Those are too easy. Too easy. So let's talk about um, a couple things that we have to be aware of coming into next week um, quickly. Um, I believe we have Uncle Jerome speaking on the Hill next week. Um, and, um, you know, that's something we have to be, be mindful of, um, stepping in front of and stuff. And I suspect the market will be slow. That's again, why we wait for that hour to show up. Um, and it's important. Let me check on this. Yeah. Uncle Jerome is on Tuesday and Wednesday. Call him Uncle Jerome. Everybody's uncle or aunt, depending on who's in charge. Um, so just be mindful of that. Again, I'm going to encourage you all just to, you know, go back and take a look at your trades and, and ask yourself when, you know, Josh and I do this every year and we ask ourselves, you know, where did most of my, our trades happen hour wise? And then what was the, the ones that we lost? What, what did we do wrong on them? Okay. The ones that we went on, those are easy, but what's the ones we lost on? Okay. So I, I challenge you guys to do that. What per product do we prefer? Well, um, well, it, okay, so I'm gonna answer it in, in a two-part question. It, it depends. Um, I like the NASDAQ, we, we all like the NASDAQ because it moves. 
Um, however, during really volatile times like we had in November and December, um, you may want to switch to the ES because it's not as volatile and um, you have less movement on that. And I say less, I mean less in, in a um, uh, point situation. Um, we like crude oil quite a bit. We trade a ton of crude oil. Um, some people like the, uh, the bonds and the notes. Um, I don't particularly trade those intraday at all. Um, I, they're too slow for me personally. Um, so it just depends. I'm a gold guy myself. I love gold, but more on a swing basis. I've got a, a secret currency that I love. Um, <laughs> and uh, people think I'm nuts for it, but I love it. And it, it, it. yeah, it's great. So um, yeah, there's a few of them, but the main mainstays are usually the NASDAQ, the ES, crude oil, um, the bonds, um, some beans. Beans are also a good trade as well. So mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, I, I'd echo that. I, typically, the typically the NQ. So uh, my rationale, I'll go back to math. So the rationale for me on the NQ is that if you look at the the average range of the of the Nasdaq relative to the ES, and you look at the margin requirement for each contract, um, you can actually get more upside opportunity. There's more intraday opportunity in terms of points for the margin outlay in the Nasdaq than the ES by about 200 bucks. Um, so that's that's one thing to think about. And um, the other thing that we're talking about order flow, um, I found that, okay, and I can just show this to you because this'll, this'll make, um, make more sense. If I, add, if I turn on the thing where I can see the histogram with the order flow. So you can see like it doesn't color everything, right? Like there's some periods where it doesn't really show some impulsive behavior. Let's go over here at the ES. Um, the ES is such a more, that's not the one I wanna look at, this one. Um, now I did, I did make some adjustments to this, but the ES shows more intensity because there's just more liquidity around that. And, um, and it's, just, it's just not as wide. Now, like back this, back this spring when we were having, uh, or in the fall, Fall, summer, when we were having lots of volatility, I traded the ES a lot. Um, but then it, it's because it was behaving more like the NASDAQ typically behaves. So I don't know if that was really value added. That was, was pretty much just a restatement of what you said, Jed. Works. Um, what's the significant difference between, or the significance of Globex and RTH? Um, regular trading hours is RTH. Um, okay, Globex tells us, uh, okay, so let's talk about this in, in the form of a bias. So when we close the market down today, depending on what time, um, time zone you're sitting in, um, we'll close it down and we'll have sort of a pre-market bias coming into Monday based on the close today and the, and, the, um, and the auction the last couple days. All right, what Globex does for us is because we have to go through a few time zones of trade, in other words, the Asian market, the European market, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that gives us a little bit different view of the bias in the morning. Sometimes we have maybe a, a positive or a bullish bias coming into the morning uh, from the night before on the close. And then Globex had different, different idea and they gap it down. Well, then our bias totally changes and that's significant because in a lot of cases, you know, if you have, if you're bullish in your mind coming into the morning and really things have changed due to order flow and auction and the overnight or the Globex session, um, you're going to fight an uphill battle um, all day long. And so we don't want to do that. Remember Josh talked about behavioral, that's part of the behavior. So we're going to watch the behavior of the Globex market and see, see if it changes any of our bias opinion. So mm -hmm. you got anything more on that, Josh? Uh, I would, I would add, the, the, I know. I mean, the only thing that I would add is, um, so expectation for the next session, there is there. So there's actually not a statistical correlation that we can pull between how one day trades and what the next day would expect. Now we have expectations around that based on how we saw value migrate, but, um, but just the raw math of it, uh, there's like, like, like today's close, like how today's close doesn't really give me, uh, insight into how Monday will close. But let's say, for example, that uh, Sunday we open and we trade below 70.54.
okay? There is then now actually a positive correlation that we would see a close below Friday's close. That, that there is math there. So when I'm, when I'm setting my initial bias, like one of the things that I'll look at first is which way did we extend the Globex range? Because just like, uh, I mean, you'll, you'll rarely see Globex engulf the, uh, the RTH session. It does happen, but rarely you see that. So, um, you know, whichever way that it's extended the RTH session is kind of the, the prior RTH session. It's kind of setting for me an initial, like here's somebody in the, in the global liquidity cycle who's willing to, you know, go that direction. And so I'm, you know, I'm going to look for places to, to join them. And I know that there's even a positive correlation that, you know, we'll see uh, higher prices. For example, and if I just look at the fact that Globex traded higher last night, um, you know, here's yesterday's close. It's, you know, we now know that there's only a 30% chance that we'll get below there. So it's a pretty good chance that we're going to have a higher close than yesterday's close. And Globex gave us an early clue on that. Not, not very actionable in terms of um, other than just kind of helping you set bias, uh, you know, is it's, it's an early thing. It's not as powerful as the IB extension. I would lean on that one far more, but it, it's, and it is a slight, it's a slight correlation. Like it's, it's just barely more than 50, 50. Some people would throw it out. It's a good question. What else? Anything else? I'm gonna go look at. Um... And again, I'll, let's go. Hey, go back to um, quickly. Go back to uh, Nasdaq. We're gonna show yep. them this. This is, uh, and believe me, we don't design it like this because we can't. Um, as much as we like to think we can move more. Well, Josh can move the. Um, I can move the cattle market the fats. So um, <laughs> I, that, yeah, I, but other than that, we can't move a market. We're not big enough. So, okay. We came down and we were talking about this earlier. We came down and we found set our buyers um, right at the IB the first time down. Then we popped up from there. Um, just a little dead cat bounce. We roll back over. And again, where do we just pause again? The IB. Okay, that, that's why the 60 minutes statistically is, a, is superior than any other time frame as far as establishing a range. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just not because everything's going to stop there. It's because th that is something that, um, um, you know, people use. They, they write algorithms around. And Josh was talking about algorithms. And let, let me just, and Brian, I see your, your, um, your uh, question here. Just a second. Um, Algorithms, everybody thinks, you know, algorithms is the way of the future. While I may not disagree with that, um, but you just have to remember how algorithms are written. They're written by people and, and they're written off things that are already existing in the market. They use VWAP constantly. I mean, VWAP, you want to just pull your VWAP up and see what happens when price hits VWAP. Okay. Um, so that's volume weighted price. Um, and so, the, I mean, so you have to understand where these things are written at and how they're written. And they use 60 minute IBs. Okay. Those are common. I mean, IB is a common term in today's environment in the trading world. Um, you'll see all kinds of stuff like that written in the algorithms. So while algorithmic trading is just that it's automated, it is a behavior still. And we have to remember that because it's designed by people with behaviors mm -hmm. <laughs> or I guess, I hope they have behaviors. <laughs> they, they have um, some unscrupulous behaviors. <laughs> so will you cover the H E yes. spread? Oh yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. The hog spread. The All right. This this is this is fun. Um, so hang on, can I can I say something before you do that? Absolutely. Now jo I like Josh's way of trading this, and you know we typically don't discuss options, you know, with people. I mean sometimes we'll we'll sh we'll talk about them, but um, I would skin this. I guess I call it skin the pig. Um, I would skin the pig a little differently, but I definitely like his way of trading this one. So, yep. So what we're looking at here is a nine month chart of the spread between the April contract of live or lean hogs and the June contract. 
and you're seeing it as a negative number. Like right now it's negative 20.8. Okay, so what that means is that the front month, the April month is $20 below the June month. Okay, so um, what, what is at play here, and this is, this is a fundamental aspect of, uh, this is where some fundamental stuff comes into play. Typically people can't play the fundamental stuff because they can't, they, they, they can't, they're not liquid enough to, to stay in the trade. And um, I, I like, you know, swing trades like this because you can see that there's a profile on the right of this deal. Um, right here, there's a point of control at 14, negative 1481. So that's, that's on this spread over the last nine months. The most trade in the spread has been at 1481. So we're trading below value right now, right? Now, add to that, that if you go back 10 years and you look at this spread, the spread between April to June, the, the, the widest that spread has ever been is negative 23 bucks. And, and by the way, uh, you know, one, one contract move in lean hog, so a dollar move is $400 per contract. Okay, so I, I believe that there is an opportunity to be long the spread back towards this target of, of negative 1481, could, could even be better than that, but that's at least target one, okay? And so I'm looking for you know, opportunities where the spread gets above 1976, and then you know, looking to defend, I, what I really love is I'd love to go see us get below that negative 23, and then, and then trade back higher and basically defend that, that negative 23. Full disclosure, I do have, I have a partial position in this spread on. I put it on this morning um, in case the thing rips higher, but I, I'll get to a full position down to 20, the net, that negative 23, and then I'll probably have a stop at negative 25. Uh, where I, be, you know, basically I'll get to where my cost basis is around negative 22. I'm looking for um, an $8 move in this thing. And so, you know, an $8 move, I'm willing to risk, you know, three, uh, three and a half dollars to get that $8 move. Other cool thing on this is um, from a capital standpoint. Um, so from a, from a capital use, if I, I think, I think from here I can, um, it's, it's very buy power effect efficient. Okay, so just if I do one spread, like you know, one contract, it's only fourteen eighty five to get in the in the trade. You know, one ES trade, you know, depending on the volatility cycle, can cost you up to seventy five hundred bucks. You know, if you, especially if you want to hold it overnight. Um, so very very you know capital. Rich. So like the thing about this, if I put one trade on, I'm basically it's cost me fourteen fifteen hundred dollars in margin. If I move, uh, if I move six bucks, I've made three thousand dollars if I get to that target. So that's, that's pretty cool in terms of uh, capital use. And, uh, and it's a very, it's a very slow trade. It's, it, you know, it's, you can see it, it just, just kind of moves back and forth. So, you know, how you kind of trade this is you kind of put orders in and you kind of, you know, leave the orders at the target and you'll start to see the, the trade move you know, toward this thing. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this, uh, this trade over um, the, the April, I think there's about 65 days still left in the April contract. So, you know, I'm looking at this, this trade to be in it for a couple of weeks. Um, if, uh, you know, up to that, but that's, that's that trade. So you can, you can profile spreads too. They're a little bit different. It's still, it's still a, uh, you're looking for a, a return to value. So you're just looking at where the value is and where that, that statistical mean in the spread is. Um, and it's, it's a very effective way to trade them. So that's the, that's the hog spread. Kind of fun. Is crude pushing lows? The piggies. Um, piggies. Yeah, it's it's also a safer way to trade hogs because <laughs> yeah, they uh, thin market man. People people call lean <clears throat> hog market the widowmaker because it can just like man, it can just chop you up. And uh, so I'm really just I'm just arbing the difference between the contracts is what is what I'm doing. And I'm yeah. I'm looking at a lot of I mean in that whole thing I'm you know there's disconnect the value. There's, you know, long-term statistical stuff. And I know, I know a, a lot of guys in, in, that are producers are watching that spread too. And they're, they're thinking about that and they're seeing, wow, that's a big spread. And so, you know, I know there's other guys who are buying that spread too. Um, so that'll, that'll help.
And and just FYI, if you're new to trading, please don't trade the hogs. Don't don't no 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 that absolutely yeah, yeah absolutely. <clears throat> our, our our full disclosure is until you can consistently pull money out of the market simulated, you should never put live dollars on the line ever. Amen. And that's a, that's about as dogmatic as I get. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, man, if you're, if you're struggling as a trader and you're not consistently pulling money out of the market, do not ever, why would you add another aspect of emotional strain and anxiety by having live dollars on the line? And, and I don't care if it's, you know, I don't care if it's money that you, um, you feel like, well, I can afford to, cause I mean, I was talking to a broker friend of mine and he, you know, somebody had like 20 in queue contracts on and they they're like, well, do they have a plan? No. But the guy's like, well, I can afford to I'm like, yikes. Yikes. I mean, tr treat trading like a business. Would you ever yeah. just throw money out there? You know, with, well, yeah, I just, uh, nobody does business that way. Nobody does business for long does business that way. Yeah. I've seen a couple people that are pretty arrogant that say, well, they start with that. Their minimum is five and they'll keep adding into them and stuff like this. And I'm like, okay, that's one disaster waiting to happen. Um, mm -hmm. I don't care if you're a scalper or not. That's a disaster waiting to happen. Yeah. So be, be, you know, um, really be wise and mindful of, you know, what trading is and that any, at any moment a rug can be pulled. <clears throat> Therefore we use, you know, we use stops, we use, um, you know, we use calculated stops. I mean, there's going to be losses guys. Just understand that. And that's okay. As long as they're small and calculated. Okay. You ever taken a trade and looked at it and go, well, that was my plan. And it, I got stopped out. Well, congratulations. That's a great trade. Yeah. Okay. Because you, you did everything you needed to do and it, guess what? It just didn't work out. And that's, that's the psychology portion of it is acceptance. You have to accept what you just did. Mm -hmm. Okay. In other words, I, I played golf at one point in my life and, and at a very high level. And what you have to, you have to understand is you have to just trust it. Okay. Mm -hmm. You have to swing away at it. You can't try to, you know, eke it, move it, you know, control it. You have to just swing it and let it and trust your, your, what you've worked on. And when you develop your trade plan and you, you have it down, you have to trust it then. Okay. And that's a hard thing because you're going to see a movement back toward your stop and you're like, I don't want to get stopped out. So I'm going to move my stop. No, don't do that. Okay. Trust your plan. Trust your, your analysis. Trust um, your, you know, trust your stops first of all. <laughs> um, and then let it go. And if, you know, we talked to some, who was this yesterday? I can't remember. Somebody in the channel. Um, we talked about why is it important to have two to one, three to one, maybe four to one risk rather than one to one risk. Okay, because you're going to be wrong some of the time. And I guess just go back and look at the flipping of the coin. Um, I think, what is it, Josh, you have to be, and here we go with math again, I'm sorry. Um, I think we have to be right almost 60% of the time or over 60% of the time um, in a coin flip to be able to make money if you have a commission on that. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, if you're that good, and I know everybody can sim at 60%, but can everybody trade at 60% in live um, in a live situation. Mm. Um, and if you can, congratulations, you're a great trader, a phenomenal trader. Yep. And there's somebody who has better stats than that too out there. I know they do. Okay. Cause I've seen them. <clears throat> However, you should plan for the worst. In other words, a 40% uh, or, le or fifth, less than 50%, but have the risk parameters there, the two to one, the three to one, the four to one, because you can have those losses and still, and still make money at it. That's right. Then you became the casino and not the gambler. That's right. So Appreciate um, always will urge you to be aware of your risk um, on that and don't overtrade, especially don't throw, I don't care if you got a half a million to, um, in your account, don't do that. Start with onesies and twosies and goes, go from there, you know. Crude pushing new lows. I saw that. It, it's too late in the day for crude. Let them do whatever they want. They're going to probably make a run here. It's crude should be closed here shortly. So, um, yeah, we'll look at, it. they're going to make a quick, probably liquidation run and then that'll be it for them. So that trades over. There's actually, there's no other trades on the, on the board at this time. I'm, I'm going to trade my trading desk for something fun. I think I'm going to go to the gym. 
I am flat and we got guests coming tonight for dinner. So that's my, my goal is to clean the house. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Like we said, we're going to be talking about this next week in our community. So if, if, if some of the things around the IB resonate with you, I encourage you to uh, jump in with us and spend the week with us. But here's a way that you can practice this is to wait for that initial balance to form in any product and observe the trade after the IB is set. And what do you see? Um, and how can you turn this into a trade idea? Uh, and uh, get started with a free week with us. Also follow us on Twitter. Talk to us on Facebook. And if you need any questions, you can always uh, send us an email or give us a call. Uh, love to help. Um, turn it around for you if we can and we'll be back next Friday but uh, that's it for today's session thanks for everybody's time thanks for sticking around with us and I uh, hope you have a great week and do something to, to fill your tank and uh, catch you next time yep thanks guys take care